Uh, today's scripture will be found on, on page, <coughs> excuse me, 595 of your Pew Bibles, uh, Joshua 14 through, uh, 14, 7 through 12. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the, the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved through the, the, the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. A young woman brought her fiance, fiance home to meet her parents for the first time on Thanksgiving dinner. After dinner, the girl's mother asked her husband to find out about the young man. So the father invited him to his study for a talk. So what are your plans? The father asked the young man. I'm a biblical scholar, he replied. A biblical scholar, hmm, the father said, admirable, but what will you do to provide for my daughter? Well, I will study and God will provide for us, the boy replied. Well, how will you buy her a beautiful engagement ring, as I'm sure that she'll want, the father asked. Well, I will concentrate on my studies and God will provide for us, the young man replied. Well, what about later when you have children and uh, how are you going to provide for them? Oh, don't worry, sir, God will provide. Well, each time the father asked a question, this young idealist insisted that God would provide. Well, later on, the mother asked, well, how did it go with your talk with this young man, honey? Well, the father answered, I believe we have a problem. He has no job, he has no plans, and he thinks I'm God. <laughs> this young man may not have understood that while it is proper to rely on God, that that doesn't mean that God is going to do everything for us. There is a part of God's work that he expects us to do. And I hope that you have understood that in this series from uh, the book of Joshua. We are to depend on God and to rely on his promises. But depending on God does not mean that we are not res responsible to fulfill our God-given responsibilities. Believing his promises doesn't mean that there isn't anything left for us to do. So how can we balance that out? And what are the results when we do? I believe this section of Joshua in chapters 14 and 15 illustrates that for us in a very practical way. What do we do with the promises of God? Well, in this story, Joshua is approached by Caleb. Now, you remember Caleb, don't you? He was one of those 12 spies that Moses had sent in years before. And um, he, he was the only one besides Joshua who brought back an optimistic report and said that the land could be taken. And so now we see that he's taking the first step in responding to God's promises, which is basically just focusing on God's promises. All of us have a choice when it comes to the promises of the Lord. We can focus on why we should hold on to them or why we don't want to hold on to them. Either way, we have a choice. Now, many years before, God had promised Caleb that he would have a special inheritance in Canaan. And so now it is time for that promise to be fulfilled. So let's go back into the life of Caleb a little bit and, and see what, what led up to this. 
Now, Caleb could have used an excuse for not taking advantage of all that God had promised because if he w really wanted that land, he was going to have to fight for it. And nobody would have blamed him if he decided that it, it really wasn't worth it. I mean, after all now, he was 85 years old. He might have felt like he was just like he was 40, but he's still 85 years old. And many years have passed since he re received that promise. And then secondly, Caleb wasn't actually a Jew. He was a Kenizzite. And we'll talk about where that comes into the story here in a little bit. Now, have you ever made up an excuse for something that you were kind of afraid to do and so you didn't do it? Well, here the situation is a little more complicated than that. You know, Caleb had some built-in excuses here if he wanted to use them. Now, 85 years old is not the typical time to go into battle and, or to begin any kind of a, a major venture. And while he was still considered part of the nation of Israel, he wasn't actually a descendant of Jacob. And when it comes down to it, a lot of us have some built-in excuses uh, in our lives. And, and be, be honest, uh, can't you always nearly find a, a, a decent-sounding reason not to do something that you don't really want to do? I do too that. <laughs> but Caleb doesn't fall into that trap, and here's why. Because he was focused on the promise. He was focused on what he wanted, and not in what stood in the way of, of what he wanted. Now, from all the things that we read about Caleb, it appears that he'd always been that way want to identify some names of some other Jewish leaders that were in Caleb's day to see if you will recognize some of these names. Shammah, Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Galdi, Amiel, Sethur, Nabi, and Gael. You recognize all those names? Me either. <laughs> those are the other ten spies who went into Canaan and said that the land could not be taken. And we haven't heard anything about them ever since. But Caleb and Joshua we know about. Well, what was the difference between Caleb and those other ten spies who didn't think that the promised land could be taken? And what is the difference today between people who accomplish great things and those who don't? Well, the ten spies only saw the risk. They measured the chance to take the promised land against themselves. But in sharp contrast, Caleb and Joshua focused on the opportunity, and they measured the giants of the land against God. And the difference was that Caleb was focused on God and what he could do, and the spies that caved in were just uh, focused on, on what they could do, and they, they just suggested we return to Egypt. There's all the difference in the world between what we can do on our own and what God can do through us. I want to show you just how extreme the challenge that uh, the Caleb tackled was. It was going to take some spectacular faith for him to follow through with this. First of all, the land that Caleb requested was special for two reasons. Uh, this was a piece of land where some of the strongest soldiers in Canaan were. In fact, that is precisely what had frightened those ten spies all those years before, 40 years earlier when they had gone into the land. This section of the land and the soldiers who were there to defend it frightened the spies so badly that they returned with their negative report. But also this section of land was special for another reason, because it contained the grave of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The father of the Jewish nation was buried there along with his sons Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob. There very well could have been some Jews who had thought that someone who was born a Jew should have been given this most special part of this promised land. And in that sense, it was a very precious piece of real estate, and it was being requested by a man who was probably a descendant of Esau, which means he wasn't a, a full-blooded Jew. And so those are some pretty good reasons maybe to just back off of this, but I want you to notice something. Caleb did not allow himself to fall prey to either one of those. Instead of focusing on why he couldn't be blessed as God said he could, he focused on why he could be. He could have settled for less than God had promised, but he didn't. And the point is, is that we either should never settle for mediocrity when God has called us to work for his kingdom, which is eternal. Ultimately, this wasn't really about Caleb. It was about what God had promised to him. In fact, there's, there's a word that's used repeatedly here in Joshua which shows that the focus was on how the land was a gift from God. And that word is inheritance. And inheritance emphasizes the fact that this land was from God. Now think about it. If you've ever received an inheritance, an inheritance is a gift given to you because of who you are and not because of, of what you do or what you did. So no wonder Caleb's focus was on God's promise, which is precisely where God wanted it to be.
In the same way, focusing on God's promises is where we need to begin, but it's not where we end. From focusing on God's promises, we need to begin to be acting on God's promises. As we read on in Joshua 15, starting with verse 13, we read, In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, descendants of Anak. From there, he marched against the people living in Debur, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. Aren't you glad I didn't make you read that part, Johnny? <laughs> yes, God promised the land to Caleb, just like he promised all of Canaan to the Israelites. But Caleb still had to go in and drive out the inhabitants there, just like Joshua and his army had to drive out the Canaanites from their lands. Now, I know all this driving people out of their land business is not the politically correct thing today, and, and by no means is an authorization for one country to attack another just because they want their land. But back then, it is exactly what God wanted his people to do, to demonstrate their belief that his word was true. Now, faith is a great thing, but true faith always involves more than just believing something is true. It goes farther than that. It's the same with love. You know, love is an emotion, but when you truly love someone, you want to be involved in their life, and you want what's best for them. And love will reveal itself through your actions. And so faith reveals itself through actions just as well. So how does God respond when our faith is demonstrated in our actions? Well, God blesses our faith by giving us greater opportunities. When we respond in faith to what we know that God wants us to do, then he works in our lives in ways that would never happen if we weren't acting on his promises. The truth of the matter is that remembering that God's promises is a good thing, but acting on God's promises is a far better thing. Some of you may remember or may even have one of those promise boxes. It used to be a very popular thing, but I haven't seen many of them lately, but I'm sure they still have them. It's a box with a lot of different cards in it, and each card contains a promise of God from scriptures. It's an amazing thing to see how many promises of God there are in his word. But the idea is to take a card each day and to think about the promise and perhaps memorize the verse and to allow that particular promise to, uh, to make a difference in your day, what God has promised to give to you. It's a great concept. I would recommend it for anybody. But the thing is, you can focus on God's promises all you want. You can memorize them and you can say that you believe them. But if you don't act on them, then they really don't do you that much good at all. In the New Testament book of James, it deals with this very issue. He says that real faith must demonstrate that it's real with action. It's not enough to say that we believe in God. We must be willing to act on what we believe. If you want to know the truth, faith and action, and, or works as we call them, it cannot be separated. If you don't believe that God can, can help you, then you'll never tackle anything bigger than what you can personally take care of yourself and what you can handle with your own ability. You'll base what you attempt on yourself and not on God. And far too many churches and far too many Christians live just like that. They never focus on what they can do through God. They're never willing to, to step out in faith and to try something bigger than they are. Far too many people never try anything difficult. And as a result, they never accomplish anything of real significance. How long has it been since you have dared to dream of what God can do through you as you rely upon Him? How long has it been since you were willing to put actions with your faith and try something that you know would never work unless God helps it to work? We must do more than just believe God's promises. We must be willing to act on them. And that requires some pretty significant faith, and it requires facing some pretty impossible situations. I love what Theodore Roosevelt once said. There's not yet been a person in our history who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. Kind of like those ten spies. I don't know about you, but I would like my life to be worth remembering. But that's probably not going to happen unless you and I are willing to do something that's hard and then when it's accomplished, to give God all the glory for it. And that leads me to the third point in this morning's message, a little different than the first two points. If we focus on God's promises, and then if we act on God's promises, then we will see the result of God's promises. Let's move on and look at chapter 15, verse 16. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. <laughs> 
Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksaw to him in marriage. One day when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. Now this might sound a little bit confusing, but let me explain. What happens when we take the first two steps that we talked about this morning, when you focus on God's promises and then you act on them? Well, what we say what happens is the result of God's promises. As we look back at verse 14, we see that, that one of the obvious consequences of trusting God and working towards God's promise for Caleb was that he actually had to drive out those strong soldiers who were already in the land. However, now it's, it seems in, the, in this next section that uh, he's trying to, to get around that a little bit. Caleb does something which at first glance seems pretty strange and maybe even kind of wrong. But he says that he's going to give his daughter's hand in marriage to the man who will attack Kiriath Sefer and overtake it. That seems kind of strange. However, there are a couple things that, that we should remember here. First of all, back in those days, parents did select a spouse for their children, so it's not the, the way that we do things now. It was very much what his daughter would have expected him to do. And on the surface, it seems like an incredibly selfish thing to do. It almost seems like he's saying, oh, my daughter isn't important for me to, to find a, a godly man for him. I just want to find somebody who can overtake this land. But don't be too quick to jump to that conclusion. Because actually, an attack on Kiriath Sephar would require that a man have similar kind of faith that Caleb did when he went in and he drove out the inhabitants of the other lands. And something else that we might miss is that there's, there's no impression here that his daughter didn't like the arrangement. In fact, she persuaded her new husband to ask her father for a field, and then she asked for a little more property in return. Caleb's daughter dared to go for what she wanted, and she was willing to ask for even more. Now, where do you suppose she got that idea for what she wanted? Do you suppose she may have picked that up a little bit from her own father? I think the answer to that is yes. She had observed her father stepping out in faith and working toward the things that he thought were important over the years. And now that she has a chance to do that, she responds the same way. She saw his faith, and it affected the way that she lived her life as well. And maybe that's the real point here. Living by faith is a powerful influence on those around us, especially our own children. The only way that our children are going to learn how to do that, other than you know, some of life's hard knocks, is if they see the example of it while they're growing up. Now, I'm not saying that you can only influence your children if you're perfect. You know, if that were true, then none of us could have a positive impact on our children. But what I'm saying is that one of the results of living the kind of life that I'm talking about here is that when our children see us living our faith, it affects them. Because we're not just talking about faith, but we're, we're living it. Now, you may be discouraged by now and ready to just give up because you know you've fallen far short of the mark when it comes to consistently living your faith in your daily life and really believing in God's promises for you. But there's no time like the present to change that. God can take our commitment no matter when and do something special with it that will far exceed our expectations. George Eliot said, it is never too late to be what you might have become. What do you want to become? Even more importantly, what do you think God wants you to become? It's never too late to begin the process of becoming that person. The way this works out in each of our lives is going to be different. You may not be a boxing fan, but you've probably heard of uh, George Foreman. He was a, a former heavyweight ch champion. But at the age of 42, he came out of retirement for one last fight. Is it because he missed the, the stage and the, the, the spotlight? Is he wanted the glory? Well, not according to Foreman. Was it for the fame? No. Was it because of the Lord? Well, actually, that is why he said he did it. See, he had become a preacher who had worked with troubled young boys, and he would get them off the streets and he'd tell them about Jesus. Now, few boxing experts thought that he would last more than three rounds against 28-year-old Evander Holyfield. And George Foreman did not win the fight, but he lasted all 12 rounds. And he got paid for the fight, which was what he wanted to happen all along, so that he could use that money for ministry. Now, I don't know what God's going to have for you. It may not be as strange as what he had for George Foreman. It may be just as normal as having the courage to go across the street and talk to your neighbor about Jesus. Jesus. 
or talk to that relative that uh, you've had a hard time broaching the subject with. But I do know that he wants you to believe him and he wants you to put your faith into action. Are you willing to do that this morning?